Yeah, and you know what, I, I almost, you know, you just kind of feel a little bit sorry in a way for our generation because, um, and you know, the younger people especially because the brainwashing that's been going on is incredible. Welcome to HLI Ireland's Let's Talk series. My name is Lisa O'Hare and today I'm delighted to be joined again by my friend and colleague Karen Brady. Karen, you're very welcome back to the show. Thank you, Lisa. Great to be back. Thanks for having me. So we have a really interesting show planned for you guys this week. We are discussing an amazing book called The Anti-Mary Exposed, Rescuing the Culture from Toxic Femininity. Karen, how was this read for you? Wow, it was very, very good. Uh, sometimes like, you know, it was great to have to find something that I've noticed over the years as a woman. Um, and it's, it's really insightful. So I'm looking forward to having our chat today. So the whole, the whole book, as the title suggests, is about toxic and really examining this uh, concept of toxic femininity within the, the realms of being an anti-Mary spirit. So we've all heard of the Antichrist. We're, you know, we're familiar with that. And just, just to go to the author herself to describe to us what she means by this anti-Mary spirit. She said, the potential of an anti-Mary is related to Mary's status as the new Eve. If Christ is the new Adam and Mary is the new Eve, it makes sense to consider that an Antichrist could have a female complement. Yes, there is a potential that this anti-Mary could be a specific individual, but there's also the possibility for there to be an anti-Marian spirit that animates an entire movement and the ind individuals engaged in it. So Karen, we're talking about a movement of feminism, particularly yeah. over the last sort of 50 years. What, you know, given what the author has described there, what would your um, perception be of this anti-Marian spirit of feminism that swept the world? Yeah, you know what, I've always kind of thought about it um, over time, like, you know, I would have grown up, gotten the message, not necessarily from my own parents, but just from society that you got to go travel, you got to have your career, put kids off for as long as you can. And, you know, I saw a lot of my own friends um, get to points in their lives where maybe they can't have children or you know they travel so much that they never could settle when they got back home and it's just this book really helped to hone in where did this come from you know and um it came from you know, maybe a time where you know the 60s where people were entering into a, a time of you know embracing their feminism and sit-ins and protests against men that have been suppressing them and made to feel like victims and um, it's just yeah that, that that's that's where that was where I was very interested in this yeah it, it looked you know what, what I find fascinating was that you know the idea of and, and it does describe that this pretty much you know a coordinated um, aspect around the world where there is, I mean, and, and its roots are possibly, you know, way back, like the idea of the French Revolution, a rejection of religion and a rejection of uh, the concept of who we are as God's children. And then, you know, obviously using, you know, the rejection of Mary and the spirit of Mary, her femininity, her beauty, her power and her um, place within you know within the home the woman's place as a mother uh, yeah. with, within the home and that's a full rejection of this and, and the book s states from the very outset the very outset the fruits of this um and and, and she she describes it bluntly at the beginning never in history have mothers been so willing to kill their own children so whilst we are wanting to explore you know the the roots of this the fruits of it are exceptionally obvious, not only in, um, you know, this idea of, of widespread abortion, mm. but we see it with a, a deep unhappiness in, in society among women. And I mean, there's a great statement on, on page 11. She said, women are not getting happier, just more medicated. I mean, that, that's pretty stark. What, what have you seen from your experience, uh, you know, in the circles that you're in of this both rejection of motherhood, femininity, and religion, and, and, and the fruits of that? 
Well, I mean, it's like what Carrie, the, the author said, but like Eve before them, so many women have never stopped to consider the full implications of their decisions. The eternal ramifications of aborting a child, contracepting, nurturing narcissism in their own souls. Um, you know, I just feel like we, there's been magazines, newspapers, Hollywood films that we've been told, you know, over and over again that it's okay to abort your child. It's okay to contracept. It's okay to sleep around. Um, in fact, it's encouraged. This is what it is to be a female. And um, it's just, uh, it's really, really hurt women, I believe, Lisa. I mean, yeah, she says that, that there can be no accident that we're witnessing an unprecedented emotional and mental trauma and brokenness in every segment of our population because motherhood has been so devalued and neglected. So, you know, as we relax into this conversation, Karen, you know, and reflecting on our own, uh, you know, we're sort of, uh, I don't know, we're, we're, we, we, we've really grown up through the explosion of this mentality and it was very subtle to begin with. Yeah. You know, it, th these things aren't so in your face. They're subtle to begin with. They're you know, as you said, career, um, position of power, what do you want to be? You can be anything you want to be. And I remember, you know, being at school and nowhere in the careers department was there a mention of motherhood. You know, either do you want to be a mother? What about a career that might work around motherhood? You know, it was, it was never mentioned. And, and I think that's become stronger today in the sense is it's like, of course, you know, we grew up at a point where doors were opening for women and that was to be welcomed. Sure. Uh, I mean, I did engineering and I was one of the very, very few girls, uh, you know, maybe there were 10 girls in a class of maybe 120 uh, fellas uh, in, at Queen's University. So it was quite unheard of to do engineering at that stage. And there were multiple grants for girls to do that. So whilst the doors were opening, there was not there was never a conversation as to, as you said, to reflect upon where this is going. Mm -hmm. What what do I want from life? If I want to be a brain surgeon, have I considered what I have to sacrifice in order to do that? Um, and I'm, I mean, I guess your experience would be something similar. Yeah, I'm like, absolutely, Lisa. There was never a, a point where someone said, hey, um, you know, you, you've had your, you've done your career, you've traveled. Would you consider maybe being a mom? That's a really great place to go. And in fact, I just remember one of my friends, peers, um, she told me when she was 35, she had three children and she was going down the road with a buggy. She had just done a PhD and she said, I feel like I've sold out if people see me with the buggy. I'm just so embarrassed and it really hit me going wow where did this come from this this way of speaking you know and um i just i'm seeing a lot of women instead of having cups of tea they're having bottles of wine now with their with their friends to fill an empty space a lot of them are not in their faith um you know gym having the perfect body is a big thing at the moment as well the perfect hair the perfect body um and it just it seems like perfectionism is coming in hugely and suicide rates have never been so high and depression and i'm a nutritionist i'm trained in that area lisa and um we're noticing that a lot of women have what's called epi um um adrenal fatigue which is at epidemic levels basically that means when you're tired but you're wired so you're going around all the time you cannot stop you just want to be at the gym get the kids home and um, you know get your career uh you know have the house looking perfect and it just seems like women are tiring themselves so much to be perfect and this is what they're getting from tv magazines and um they're not really realizing how much they're loved by the lord in yeah. just the way they are as women, how they're made. Well, the book, yeah, I found that the book, you know, um, was exceptionally clear in outlining the roots of this. That You know, if you look at these, uh, the initial sort of, uh, as you say, the leaders of this feminist movement, the, the, the names of, of people that you'd that become synonymous with it, a lot of them had like deep mother wounds or wounds in their childhood of either rejection or a deep unhappiness and or restlessness like you described that women have and in in many ways uh carrie the author has has acknowledged that and and she she describes it you know that they are not they are not recognizing this ache within us all 
as St. Augustine mm. said, my, my heart is restless until it rests in you. And unfortunately, that ache that was recognized um, as, as, a, as an aching for God, for something more, was channeled then into a rejection of everything that seems mundane or somehow um, a bondage of description that you must, that in order to find that peace, you must break off the shackles of, of commitment, of motherhood, of, uh, of, of nurturing, of, of your fertility. And the book's very clear about the rejection of fertility. So, it, it, I mean, she, she does look at the roots of that, but what we're seeing then as this sort of handed on down through, like you say, magazines and, and uh, social media mm -hmm. is, is this, um, this idea that we, we do all ache for something and we're never, we're never happy. And, you know, media and keeping us distracted means that we never reflect on why we have this sense. I mean, I'm, I'm a mother of, of eight children and I do remember the early years of motherhood. You know, I, I played football to a high level. I, um, I, I had a career, did engineering. So I had a, you know, a fairly fulfilled life. And I remember those early years of motherhood were very, very difficult because I had been so conditioned in my own independence, independence financially, independence of my time. Mm -hmm. um, also like sort of self-esteem with colleagues. And suddenly that's all... As, as the feminists would say, taken away from you and you're then hidden within the home. And they're putting a name on this as you must, you know, you, you've you failed or this is to be rejected. Whereas coming from a faith perspective, we must look to Our Lady to be hidden. So she was uh, immensely powerful. And in fact, in the 2015 uh, National Geographic, she was described as one of the most powerful women in the world. And that's the National Geographic, you know, the secular, secular media. Her power was in her hiddenness. Mm -hmm. And I think women are, have been sold this lie that there is something that they need to change within their lives rather than they need to look within their own vocation and really recognize that this is part of a hidden journey of, of building and nurturing something much bigger than yourself. That was my own, you know, perspective on it. No, absolutely, Lisa. I mean, if you look at the Sunday magazines and the newspaper in the Irish Independence or whatever, I mean, they're telling you that it's, you know, you can only have a child if you, you know, have enough money. And of course, there's some aspect of that, but they never talk about the goodness of having a child and the success stories of, you know, being a mom at home who you, you know, at home with your children, which you'd never trade for anything. They don't, they don't talk about that. And basically motherhood was seen as paras parasitic, you know, yeah. housewife is a leech, um, you know, it, just not to be celebrated. And it's the opposite of what we've been, you know, uh, what we would have seen as motherhood over the last millennia, really. It's just yeah. the last 60 years. Karen, you know, there's, an, there's a, a lot of focus on fertility in the book and the difference between the sterility of the um, feminist movement and, and, you know, obviously the fertility of, of, of following Our Lady. But it's not only about physical fertility. And I think mm -hmm. there's a beautiful uh, reflection when it talks about the Magnificat, about Our Lady magnifying the Lord and making visible the invisible goodness of God. And that's what we're all called to do. And we have to respect our virginity and our purity um, in imitation of Mary, because then we can share in her, and the book says this, in her remarkable fruitfulness, both in our own lives and family and society. So I think, you know, you'd be keen to point out bearing fruit that's not necessarily um, the fruit of, of children. And, and that's a very important message to get out to women, particularly, you know, when, when we're becoming, um, we're into older age. Yeah, I'd agree. And fertility is the desire to do goodness, to do to be helpful, which is in, really embedded into us, I believe, as women. So this is a lovely quote from um, William Golding, the author of The Lord of the Flies. Um, so he says, I think women are foolish to pretend they are equal to men. They are far superior and always have been. Whatever you give a woman, she will make greater. If you give her sperm, she'll give you a baby. If you give her a house, she'll give you a home. If you give her groceries, she'll give you a meal. If you give her a smile, she'll, if you give her a smile, she'll give you her heart. I think that's very nice. 
Um, yeah, I think that's that says it all. Um, probably my my old feminist self wouldn't have thought too much of that. Um, really? Well, you know, give, you know the way you're kind of saying, "Oh, sorry, give my give me a home, and I'll make you know, I'll give me a house, and I'll make a home. Give her give her groceries, and she'll make a meal." It's it's actually really beautiful when you go into your faith and you realize exactly. Yeah. What that means. I, I mean, because I, I laugh at that going, "I'm not great at doing the meal bit," you know. So, but I think I think, and like you say, that maybe will repulse some people. I think that's it's fair enough to say that that way. But why is that? What what? Are, it's incredible isn't it like when you yeah. think of it it's yeah if I told that to some of my feminist friends they'd be like come on and yeah. well now I'd look at that and I think wow I mean that's that's so true that's really cool it's great to be able to have that gift as a woman you know yeah and, that, yeah. and obviously there's a, there's a spectrum you know of of uh Sort of feminine or, or masculine traits and I think that's what the world's trying to reject at the minute there is even a difference between masculinity and femininity and it's, it's all one big amorphous mess but I, what you know just continuing on from that quote because it just going on ahead of it you know it's saying that a woman multiplies and enlarges what is given to her and then it goes on to talk about that we uh, w- women are called to contain others not just to hold on to them but to improve them and let them go again healthier stronger better prepared for the journey and you know the, the word vessel was used and if you think about the litany of our lady she is called you know the vessel that's a word like that could be rejected by feminists who say i i don't want to be a vessel you know i don't want to be such a menial object but that is the complete paradox of our lady and if you think about the other greatest saints um saint bernadette described herself as a brush yeah Saint Teresa of Alcala, pencil in the hands of our Lord. But yeah. It's not that the, the, that the grace and the power comes from us as women. It comes from God through us. That's right. And I think that's really key to get through to all young girls and all women, regardless of physical motherhood, regardless of fertility, um, in the sense of, of physical fertility. We've got to be so so careful that this is put on the heart of all of us which is to channel the graces of God through us to make the world a better place. Throughout history, you know, we, we've obviously had struggles and hardships and pain associated and a desire to make life better for ourselves. And what's happened is that mm-hmm. people have in this desire, and, and I mean, it comes culturally as a broader issue than just femininity, but, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's the, as I said, a uh, rejection of, of religion and a rejection of something more than the here and now. Now, what, what uh, Carrie, the author, does then is she talks about the, how this is completely opposite to Our Lady. Mm. And she, she used three words with regard to Our Lady, power, beauty and fruitfulness. And she contrasts the difference of the kind of power that Our Lady has, the kind of beauty that Our Lady has, the kind of fruitfulness that Our Lady has compared then with the sterility of the uh, the feminist movement, the power hungry, as you say, narcissistic, um, dominant um, side of the feminist movement, and then this whole idea of what beauty is, and this idea of the you know the the glossy airbrushed beauty. Um, that, that, that the world is offering now compared to the inner beauty of, of Our Lady. And I mean, I, I find the section of fruitfulness particularly interesting. I mean, she quoted Edith Stein and she said, women fulfill themselves by giving something of their own life so that others may have life. So it's, it's giving yourself to bring life. And it's all about um, this idea of, of, of bearing fruit in the world of bearing goodness. Whereas, you know, by its very nature, feminism is sterile. It doesn't want the fruit of love. It doesn't want the fruit of sacrifice. It Mm. wants, uh, you know, pleasure and satisfaction instantly. Um, I thought that was interesting. You know, you you reflected on the idea of power and and women who who have found themselves in, striving for a particular power compare that to the the power of our lady absolutely yeah and you know what i i almost you know you just kind of feel a little bit sorry in a way for our generation because 
Um, and, you know, the younger people, especially because the brainwashing that's been going on is incredible because to be a woman, we're made to be made to be victims at all costs, no matter what are, you know, for successful or not successful, we are just naturally victims. And I feel like, you know, we use that. Um, they never speak about the toxic fem uh, femininity. They speak always about toxic masculinity. And there are aspects of women that could be overpowering um, and, you know, do want to over dominate in some aspects. And it's, it's probably hard for us to to kind of see this in ourselves because we, we nobody ever speaks about it, it seems, in magazines or TV or anything. It's never spelt out. So it's the first time I've kind of heard, read it in a book about this. And um I think a lot of men might see it in their own wives or, you know, within their own mothers. Well, I, I think, you know, there's, there's a sort of a, a contrast here because we've, we've grown up with the idea of the Irish mommy, you know, the strong, dominant Irish, Irish mommy. But I think the Irish mommy was probably more a reflection of Our Lady than, than we would choose to, uh, to recognize. You know, when, I, when we mentioned, when we talked about power, the power of the mother in the prayers that she said and the insistence that she would never give up on her child and her absolute desire to see her child happy that is, that is the power of a mother and they um, say that our lady she fights like a mom yeah you know, for us and i yeah. think another person you could think of there would be mother angelica because you know sometimes we think of our lady and you think oh my goodness like i could never aspire to her but i think our lady you know she fights like a mom and that can be like what you said the irish mammy or the italian mama um these are these are women that would never give up on their, their vocations in life, whether that's a nun or, you know, a consecrated virgin for whatever they're doing for society or a mother. And um, absolutely, Our Lady is powerful. I mean, look at how Our Lord had Our Lady crush the head of the serpent, so much humiliating the, 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 um, the Satan. You know, it's yeah. incredible that he's used a, a lowly maiden yeah, and I think, again, this whole idea of power has been twisted, you know, that, that, that femininity is saying that you must dominate over your husband, that you that, 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 we, that women must be more powerful than, than men, that, that if we rule society rather than this patriarch, then society would be in a better place. And, you know, yeah. there, there's a constant barrage of lies of what, what power is and how it can be utilised. And, and whilst, you know, it, the book is very clear and we know from our faith, you know, that that Mary was no doormat, that we're not called to be, uh, when they use the word surrender, it's not, um, it's not a sign of weakness. It, and I think that the book was beautiful in, in how it described, um, if I can find the quote, um, how Our Lady, you know, you don't surrender to someone that you don't have full trust in. Yeah. And, but when you do surrender to someone that you trust implicitly, who you know has your best interest at heart, that is in fact liberating. You know, and I found that within my own marriage, for example, you know, whilst I came into it as, you know, you know, very sort of single-minded and dominant and, and, and very independent in all sorts of ways, I found then that, that having, having a husband then to surrender to was actually very liberating to have someone to take care of you not 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 trample over you not undermine you but sort of to take you under your under under his wing um, yeah i think a lot of women just sorry to, to interrupt you there just before you go on lisa um a lot of women i know are finding it tough, difficult because a lot of their husbands are not in their faith and you know the way like I have a wonderful husband and, you know, I feel like I can, you know, be under his, you know, wing and feel very confident in that because I feel like he's doing the will of God. He prays and he's asking the Lord direction. But I, I feel that a lot of women who are in their faith now, um, possibly newly and their husbands aren't or vice versa, you know, um, they're, they're finding it difficult because maybe their husband is leading down, them down a path that they don't necessarily want to go. So there is that difficulty too, you know. There's no question. And, um, you know, with, with Jude, respect the, this whole um the dominant feminine feminism has also uh, produced a generation of weak men and i think you know that has to be acknowledged to a certain degree as well which is not helping the situation where we need strong strong men and but this is very much uh, like it's it's a growth first of all it's a recognition of the issues that we have of, yeah. of who we are and how we have been sort of seduced or 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 how we've been influenced by this culture 
recognizing that first and then slowly and gently trying to uh, come back to Our Lady. And again, the book is very uh, um, sympathetic to women that have found themselves in that situation. And, and the author says that, you know, Our Lady's grace has no bounds. The grace of our Lord has no bounds in terms of the healing that, that Our Lady can bring through, you know, or that Christ brings through Our Lady. And that there's nothing that we can't, can't be rescued. But certainly there's a lot of toing and froing to go. And that's why the likes of the, the longevity of marriage is so important because people are finding they're getting into the early stages of marriage. They're finding this conflict and then they're giving up. You know, again, we have this issue where there's there, 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 there's no opportunity for growth, for change, for working these things out because they're they're difficult. I mean, I'm I married 15 years and we're still trying to work these things out mm. and these tendencies that we have. That's what marriage is for. It's to sort of scour the virtue or the the vices that we have, force us into being more patient, force us into. Um, all, all of the uh, the virtues that we aspire to people are just not recognizing that and they're, they're giving up too quickly and then they're you know as I said casting off uh, these 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 you know bondages as they, as they call it yeah and I think suffering is to be avoided at all costs in our society you know there's no there's no such thing as a you know they're not unfortunately because the lack of faith and really bad catechism over the years people have not been see have not been taught that you know suffering is a virtue it's something that in the end like giving birth to a baby in the end has so much beauty and, and and merit to go through it and um i think a lot of marriages are giving up uh, very quickly while the ones that have endured the ones that have really gone through you know difficult times i mean they're more stronger than ever at the end and more love is there mm -hmm. and i mean we, we've been told we, we spoke about it before about the idea of, of of picking up your cross and and carrying it and and this idea of embracing suffering which is completely countercultural. But also what's talked about in the book, you know, that in, in our, our femininity, in our womanhood, we have a desire to nurture or an instinct to nurture. And if we follow Our Lady, we're, we're, we're nurturing what is good and what is beautiful. We're nurturing truth. We're nurturing children. We're nurturing, uh, you know, goodness. But yeah. on the other side, on the opposing side, what, what's being nurtured is, like you say, this victimhood, this, this uh, holding on to pain. And it's, it's completely opposite. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's very, very damaging and dangerous for anyone to sort of nurture and hold on to grievances and hold on to the, this kind of pain because it's, it's, you know, there is a very dark end to that, that kind of um, thought that's that's so true I mean what you're saying there is very true like I mean I've noticed that when I grew up in America I would have listened to you know um you know feminist women from like G.I. Jane um Jane Fonda and she she would constantly say things like pro-choice war on women rare safe and legal and this was like NLP it was neuralistic programming that we heard over and over again and Carrie does bring up that 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 and I never really thought of it until I read it in the book. And I thought it was so interesting. There was a quote in there as well from Madeleine or Albright, the former Secretary of State. She said, and I remember her actually saying this when I was when I was younger, and I, I never really thought twice about it, but it's pretty bad. There's a special place in in hell for women who don't help each other. And this is basically a subtle way of telling women how they should vote or how they should think. And um, it really, really is coming on, you know, it's, it's making women feel like they got to be sisters, they got to be looking after each other. And, you know, for us to think outside the box where you might think, my goodness, an abortion may not be the right thing, or maybe I do want to be a mother. Um, maybe I don't want to have that career. Um, these were things that you, you would be kind of betraying your sisterhood. And uh, it was really good that it was spelt out in the book there. And a lot of women never ever heard that there was an alternative to abortion and I just think that is so true when do we ever hear there's an alternative to abortion if you are in a crisis pregnancy just never growing yeah. up it's you know it's like it's it's like their you know their altar of you know of, of the ultimate um prize and the ultimate sign of liberation is to be able to cast off your children and it's, it, it is demonic and the book does not hold back there are parts of the book that I find quite disturbing from that respect, 
I did talk about witches and the occult and this whole idea of um, the, the really dark side of this, this the, the feminine goddess, and that comes into that sisterhood idea. And, and it talks then even about lesbianism being the ultimate expression of this sisterhood, the purest sexual form in their words. It's also distorted. And I found those parts of the book, you know, quite disturbing. And mm -hmm. as you say, it's only the sisterhood only seems to apply if you think a certain way. And the sisterhood doesn't apply to help sisters in need, according to your own Christian beliefs. And a bit like Our Lady of Fatima, you know, when she's saying about the heirs of, you know, communism will penetrate the whole world. And this is a huge Mark Marxist ide ideology, this way of thinking. And we have to realize where this is coming from a Marxist place. Yeah. And also, and also um, the, the idea of, of, a, of a complete, um, what's the word, you know, an idea of a rejection of objective truth. Mm -hmm. an objective truth of what is good and um carrie talks about that that instinct in all on, on women you know to help each other you know this idea of the sisterhood or to help people who are in crisis in setting up homes or um shelters or, or whatever else but the, the, they're they're missing the point of what's objectively good so there there is an instinct to um and a desire to give to others but it's it's distorted by the, the concept of of what is good and you have a quote there from thessalonians from saint paul who who really outlines when people lose a sense of what is truth yep it's uh, i think it's really sums it up lisa saint uh, paul describes a lawless one who would come and deceive because they refuse to be saved Therefore, God sent upon them a strong delusion to make them believe what is false. Yeah. So people not attached to that truth of Christ. That's You're right. not attached to that truth of Christ. If you've bought into all of these ideologies, then you will live with delusions, believing what is false to be true. And, and, and this is really what we're finding at, so at the very nub of this, what is false and, and these beliefs that 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 you know against motherhood, against children, uh, against marriage, against religion. Th th there's a, a strong beliefs here because they have detached themselves from Christ. And as you say, this comes right back to 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 communism, and right back to a rejection of religion in the public sphere. Yeah, and our Lord, you know, puts it on our souls to be searching for Him. And I think a lot of women now are looking for it through mindfulness and yoga and tarot cards and you know uh, palm readers. It's a huge thing for, you know, parties with women um, getting a palm reader in or your tarot card read. So you know, there's such an ache for the Lord. There's a there's an ache for the truth. But everything but Catholicism. That's all you get in the papers day in and day out on the radio do not go down the, tr the the route of catholicism it's unhip it's uncool and there's too much negativity there and people don't realize the fruits how women are celebrated in the church they think that it, you know it's it's behind the times and all that not at all our lady is so revered so honored and, you know, it is Catholicism, we have to remember, that brought l most of our universities, uh, schools, and these were run by these incredible nuns, hospitals, um, were run by these nuns back in the 1900s as well. And they ran the place like a military operation. And I just, you know, we have to remember that it's Catholicism that really brought women to, to the fore, the way that the Lord treated the women in the Bible was yeah. so much dignity so much love and i never never had that happen before before christ yeah it's 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 funny because because um i mean that's what carrie states she says catholicism is actually the only antidote left standing to deal with all of these struggles in the feminine heart you yeah. know it, so it's, it's contrary you know it's not the problem it's the only solution ours is not a trendy diversion as women from the last 20th century can attest but it is the most powerful force on earth when unleashed. We have the most powerful force on earth. So Karen, you recommend uh, <laughs> the book then to our, not, not for the faint hearted. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, and some parts are a bit like, whoa, I see a bit of me in there. So, yeah. um, but it's it's good, it's good. We need to be aware of this. I think it's a book 
for the future um we yeah. i think it's a book that you know you just couldn't you can read it a few times and get yeah. lots out of it i agree i think i go through it with a highlighter again and again yeah. picking up things and, and, and looking at things and reflecting them so so there you go great Thanks Thanks so much for that um to all of our viewers we hope that you enjoy this sort of conversation uh, stroke book club uh, on this book please remember that we're doing all this as part of a journey with you to christ holding the hand of our lady and um, we're hoping that these these sort of discussions inspire challenge ta challenge you and as i said we at hli ireland are working and praying for an ireland where god is first life is sacred and the family is cherished until the next time god bless thank you